Hello, welcome to a slightly happier Tune Under podcast tonight. That's the first time Newcastle have won a match for some time. Um, actually, it's the first time since the last game in this cup competition, <laughs> which was against Wimbledon. So I'm Jack in Brisbane, and I've got Mark also in Brisbane. That was a bit more like it, wasn't it, Mark? Yeah, it's been, it's been a long long time between drinks, as they say. Um, but uh, it's always nice to celebrate a win. I, I have to admit, I, I said before this, I'm absolutely wiped, um, and I didn't get up for the match live this morning because it was like, what, half five or something kickoff? Um, but yeah, saw, saw the results, um, thought, oh, yep, that's nice. Saw all of the positive stuff coming through on, on Twitter for a change, which is, which is refreshing and, and nice to see. Uh, and then obviously watched the, watched the replay, uh, back today. So yeah, all good. Love these times. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was good. Um, it was, it was definitely much, much better than what we've seen recently or I don't know, recent performances have not been bad yeah. and this was Fairly similar, I thought. Although we we scored the goals and we got the result, so I was in the middle of um, getting the kids ready to leave the house. So I was watching it. I had one eye on it, but these these kickoff times are quite hard because that's like peak morning chaos yeah. time in my house. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, wow. I managed to stick something on Netflix for them, so I managed to um, to watch most of it. So <laughs> excellent, yeah. I could see from what from what I was watching that it was it looked a bit more coherent. We looked a bit it looked a bit better balanced, and we can talk about some of the reasons why that might be. Yeah. Um, Chelsea made eleven changes. Obviously, we played them three days ago, three or four days ago, um, and they only actually brought one player on who'd appeared in that league game as well. So they had basically a completely fresh team. We made five changes, so we brought in Kraft, Kelly, Longstaff, Gordon, and Joe Willick. It's probably fair to say that those changes really worked out in this particular game, didn't they, Mark? Yeah, it's it's interesting when you talk about Chelsea because one one of the things that I'm expecting uh, from from everyone is is oh yeah you haven't played anyone yet oh you've only ever played Chelsea Chelsea made loads of changes it's like well yeah but when you've got sort of like three first elevens and you've spent like 1.8 billion pounds or whatever on on signing like World Cup winners and they can't get in your first team it's hard to feel sorry for them uh, so you know it's like every single one of those players is probably a household name in terms of they played most of last season for them. So yeah, from from a Chelsea point of view, I don't think you can feel too hard done by as a Newcastle fan that we've actually managed to put a good performance and get a really good result for us as well, um, which is really important. Um, having the changes, it was it was interesting because I, I, you were looking at the the changes that we made, and and it's like arguably some players that we're not hundred percent sure on if they're you know the 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 best choice for for starting a game or whether or not they're coming back from injury are they going to be um you know you know bit bit rusty or whatever um but everything just clicked it, it really did it's like it looked like we were kind of pushing back to the best of uh, of, of Eddie Howball um which which we've we've all been crying out for and and as you as you touched on we we've had the res, we've had the had the results early on when we all felt we were playing poorly. Um, and then despite all of the bedwetting and and uh, and all of that lately on, on socials, there's there's been this positivity from some of us that have been looking at the bigger picture. And I think it, it looked like we were getting that kind of little bit of flow back to our game. It looked like we were starting to sort of get a little bit more um, sort of back to the the Newcastle that we want to see, getting a little bit more control on the ball, getting a bit more form. Um, but the results just weren't going our way. Um, but, you know, finally something's clicked for us and, and we've 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 had a game where we've played well um, and managed to get a, a convincing win as well. Yeah, and we scored goals at, at a good time in this game when, it, 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 thinking back to the Brighton game, we should have scored goals in the first 25 minutes of that game as well and we just didn't if we had i think that would have been a equally comfortable victory and so yeah sometimes it goes for you sometimes it doesn't it, it looked a bit dodgy when joe linton missed that chance right at the beginning after about three minutes it was a really nice move and isaac put it in for him and joe linton was there at the back and we know he's jigsaw joe so he's not exactly a prolific goal scorer but then we did get the quick fire goals, 23 and 26 minutes. 
Um, Chelsea had a few chances and a couple of they broke through a couple of times, and um, so it wasn't all one way traffic. But that was a that was a hallmark of us last season when we scored so many goals. We got quick goals in, in succession. I think I counted it towards the end of the season. I think we did it something like twenty five times where we scored a goal and then we scored another one within fifteen minutes. So. That was what we were so good at. We we get the momentum, we get the confidence, and we just sc- start scoring goals. And the first goal was very much like a 2022-23 goal, wasn't it? High pressing, forcing yep. errors, and then clinical finishing. And that was some of the nice things about this game just reminded me of that season, two seasons ago, and elements of last season as well before the wheels fell off. That was what, yeah, that was kind and of Joe Linton was, was back to his best with that as well. He he was the one that was kind of forcing the turnovers. He was pressing players. He was kind of just leaving his his leg in a little bit to you know leave a mark and say right, I'm here. Don't dally on the ball next time, or I'm going to be here again. Um, it, it was it was good to see that kind of that high press back again, um, which, which which I think we've all said was was quite uh, quite absent uh, by its conspicuousness the, uh, the the previous few games. Yeah, and really it's been absent for a long time. And, you know, there's different theories about whether this is a, a direction or advice from the new performance director, whatever his yeah. title is, James Bunce, whether he's saying you can't do this so much because there's going to be problems. You get Players are going to get injured, which, which mm-hmm. did happen. Um, or whether it's a whether it's a, a tactic, a, a conscious tactic to try and control games a little bit more and not rely on so much chaos, or whether it's just that, you know, Miggy's not there as, as much anymore, so, and he was he was vital to that, and, and Trippier is not there, so he changes the way we play. We've had slow defenders, so and we saw that in the league game against Chelsea, really exposed, Fabian Sharp, yep. and he did the same in this game. He was late for a tackle, and he got booked early on, but Dan Boone was getting the absolute runaround in that, in that league game in the first half, Nicholas Jackson was just dropping. Byrne was man marking him, and then he couldn't get back into position. And then yeah. Cole Palm was playing in all the space. So we definitely probably it looked like we we'd learned a bit from that, even though it was a different team. But we, I think we our tactics for this game were a good response to what Chelsea were doing because we knew we know that Chelsea are going to play out from the back. They're going to try and pass mm. it around, and we we punished that, didn't we? I think that was that was a conscious. A decision to play that way in this game and it was the right tactics for this game yeah i kind of when i was when i was watching that back it was weird like i, I felt chelsea were potentially a little bit disrespectful in terms of how they were trying to play out from the back like they seemed to be taking it way too easy and giving us that chance to to really maybe they weren't expecting it because it's not what we've been doing this season i don't know but yeah we, we were right in their faces and we forced a couple of turnovers Within, in that first half, um, we scored from one of them, but we we had a couple of extra chances from from other turnovers with that that really pressing style in in people's faces and 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 just not not just winning the ball back, but forcing mistakes as well, which I thought was really good. Yeah, yeah, I think we got we got it spot on, um, and of course, you know, we would could have been saying a similar thing about the Brighton game if we'd have taken the chances about Everton. We should have won that game. Yeah. You were talking before about you know bad performances earlier in the season, and Fulham was really bad. That was a real low point of this season. Even though we haven't actually won a Premier League game since then, I think performances there's definitely been an uptick, yeah. and we could have got something from every game. We should have beaten Everton and Brighton. We could easily have got a point at Chelsea. So I think it's nice to have a result that rewards the general level of performances which have been improving. And it was important think, to win this as well. But for, for Eddie Howe, it was important to win this as well, wasn't it? Because 100%, of everything, 100%, had, yeah. everything yeah. Everything that it, started to happen. Well, we, we've we've said this pretty much like we've been this momentum side ever since the takeover. Like it when we're riding that wave, we're we're almost unstoppable. Um and, and when the crowd certainly at home and the crowd get behind them, it's like the players just feed on that. They do. They go over and above. They'll crash into tackles. They the little dark arts were back as well. I noticed in this game, which was which was good to see. It was like a little bit of niggle, a little bit of kind of gamesmanship, which which we've missed. And it's like it, it was a big part of our success when we when we had that Champions League winnings, um, Champions League can, uh, qualifying season. The um, the pressure was definitely on how. Um, that as I said, like the the sensible 
people among us were potentially suggesting the performances were improving and things were looking positive and we were moving in the right direction. Uh, the, the results weren't there. And I think there were a lot of people that were that were kind of starting to focus on that and starting to get a little bit antsy over uh, over just looking at the results and not really seeing the bigger picture. So yes, 100%, the pressure was on Eddie Howe and it was ridiculously good to get this win. Um, just for that, just just to like ease the pressure a bit, hopefully it means we can go into the next game against Arsenal um, with, with a little bit more confidence, a little bit more fuel in the tank, a little bit more backing from the fans. Uh, and, and then, you know, who knows what can happen in that one. Yeah, I think a lot of the pressure has been social media based, though. So yeah. Luke Edwards made a point of saying, you know, fans that go to the game, there's never been any question about the, his support from the stands at both home and away games. So, yeah. um, but he, he's like like any football manager, you know, he needs to get results, um, and we haven't been getting results lately. So, like for for me, I'm still way you know, way miles away from ever thinking he shouldn't be the manager anymore because uh, I think he's still got the credit in the bank. And yep. there's been all of those um, mitigating factors, the transfer window, all of the upheaval over the summer to take into account. But th- like, you, you do worry a bit that that's not how football owners see things, especially mm-hmm. with the him losing key allies at yep. board level. And, and he's, he's had... Paul Mitchell brought in, and it's fair to say he's been brought in above him, or he's been brought in to do some of what Eddie wants to do, and and how much control is he willing to give up? Who knows, you know? And I think I said I said last week, you know, you've got to think if the club don't want, if 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 Eddie's not going to change and give up some control, and if the club are not, if the club are committed to the way they're going to go with Paul Mitchell and the the model they've got. Maybe the club are just going to decide. Look, it's, it doesn't matter how good a manager he is and how well thought of he is. He's not going to fit into what we're trying to mm. do. And, and part of me thinks if that is what they're thinking, and I didn't really want to talk about Eddie Howe losing his job in this podcast, but it's been such a, a theme over the last few weeks. But part of me thinks maybe if that's what they what they do want to do, maybe it's just in everyone's interests if they just make the call, you know, and get their own man in, which is absolutely not what I want to happen. But no. Yeah, it depends on what the club and what the owners and what Piff are thinking. And I think we've, it's a big January, isn't it, to see if it's just if about it can to be say, yeah. 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 yeah, I think January is the big, big litmus test of, of the pair of them. And uh, I think we've, we've seen, we've, we've just bought um, like some 17 year old Georgian player or something, and we're after an 18 year old Brazilian. Um, so I, I, it's safe to say Mitchell's probably putting his network out and trying to get some some more in from the youth academy that, that we can bring through. Um, but the, the big test will be in the summer um, and that desperate need for a right wing, um, potentially, you know, potentially a, another centre half um, to play alongside Botman or Kelly. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's there's other plans in, in motion as well. But but yeah, the, the the big thing will be how that goes and how it's perceived in the media more than anything. Because one of the big things when when Mitchell was brought in was Eddie was clearly not happy. Um, he he made some comments in the media that were were very quickly jumped on, and, and as the media does, they've blown it out of proportion. We we don't know what's gone on behind the scenes. You know, Eddie Howe's potentially had the England job talking um, going in the background as well. He's seen someone being brought in above him to do his job that he sees, and in, in like you know, he's he's trying not to lose control. Um, I, I think some of it was probably just you know him laying a marker down just going look i don't mind you doing this but don't expect me to just give up everything because i still want to have a say in in what i'm supposed to be working with which which i fully agree with by the way um i don't think a manager can work with a director of football who just does his own thing and doesn't consider what the manager actually needs or wants in this side there's there's obviously issues going on with the fans and and uh the expectation that you know certain players are still there and they shouldn't be but the reality of the situation is if nobody was willing to pay us what Eddie Howe deemed an, an adequate fee um if they didn't want to pay us at all for players in some in some cases then you know I, I think Eddie Howe's probably right to go well is it worth losing that player for that much we're not going to be able to get someone better 
um, it's better just to keep them around because they are part of that that team that we've had going and, and we want to just build on that for another season. And if we lose them at the end of that season, then great. But, you know, like it's, it's hard done by. But let, let us lose players when it's on our terms and when we've got replacements, not when... Um, you know, just just because we ha- we can or we have to, um, that's that's the I, big thing. I think that's exactly right. And anyone who's ever managed a team or managed people, um, Eddie, Eddie gets this thing thrown at him that he's too loyal and that he's got his favourites and things. Well, I've I'm a manager of a team and I've got my favourites, and because I'm a human being, you know, who who wouldn't, you know, like you you trust people who who are going to do the job and who have got a good attitude and who role model the kind of positive behaviours you want. So. If you know, we're not going to be able to sell people like Sean Longstaff, or who I'm going to talk about about him later, but Dan Byrne as well, Miggy, Callum Wilson. You know, like there's there's from Eddie's perspective, if he's like you just said, if he's not going to be able to sell them and replace them, what's the point in letting yeah. them go? You know. Yeah. But I think it's going to be really important that everyone go. Everyone's clear coming into January what what we need to do. Whether we're going to go big in January, it's sometimes not the best window to spend in how much money there is to spend who knows but alignment and unity is going to be key we can't have another month or two months or three months like over the summer where he's getting asked questions in every press conference about his relationship and when he last spoke to paul mitchell that was so destabilizing and i hope everyone at the club did you manage to put him on your christmas card list yet (laughs) yeah i just hope everyone at the club has actually realized that the the errors over the summer so that, that, that they're not repeated in the middle of January when, of course, we're playing football still. And another thing I was thinking about, Eddie Howe, like he, he's not the kind of manager to come out and complain about, you know, not getting players in and not getting transfers in. Like yeah. other managers do do that. He doesn't do that. And he's always big on working with what he's got and improving what he's got. But something he had in 22, 23 was momentum. And he, yeah. it, he started that the season before by getting that team winning games. And then it carried on through 22, 23. And, He's lost that a bit, and I, I think he, the club lost momentum in last last January, last winter, when we had all of those injuries and when we didn't manage to sign any players. Yeah. And then it's kind of continued in that way, even though form was not too bad towards the end of last season. But th- there has been that momentum shift, and it's kind of continued into this season. We were, we were scrapping results, and then we haven't been getting results. So it's really hard for him to try and get that that magic back that we had and that confidence that we had in 2022, 23 and at the beginning of last season as well, to be fair, the kind of momentum that led us to that PSG night. So I think his big job is how to, you know, work with his players he's got, keep them engaged, keep them motivated and get that momentum back. And I'm hoping that this win over Chelsea might just be the start of that. What do you think about that? I'm, I'm hoping so. Um, yeah, as we've said, it's like we are that team that needs that momentum to to build on uh, and and get the results on the back of that. And, and it's been hard. And, and I think for the fans and the players and probably Eddie Howe as well, the fact that we had such a an upheaval of a summer um, in terms of losing two players that we were – I think everyone had kind of invested that, well, are going to be kind of playing a part this season. And I think Eddie Howe's already said that Minte would would probably have been in the first team picture this season um, had he been had he still been here. And obviously Elliot Anderson, local lads, supports the club, was friends with Gordon. Gordon was touted around, Gordon's lack of form, you know, and then, oh, well, it's because he's had his head turned by Liverpool. It's like, well, no, actually, it turns out he's just been working on a new contract and he's like, you signed a new deal with us. So that shows you how much his head was turned. Um, so look, look, I think the summer was was very very disruptive, uh, and obviously yes, the Mitchell thing. He came in, we didn't sign any players, and I think that was the big thing. It's like the the gay saga just dragged on and on, and it, it's hard to kind of say right. Well, we were willing to pay seventy million for him, and then there's not going to be any money available in in January because like, mm-hmm. well, what were they going to pay for his fee with? So there has to be money there. Um, but the fact that that dragged on and we didn't end up signing anyone, we like pay overpaid for a keeper just to keep uh, PSR on side. And it's like it, the whole thing was just this, this like just mess. And I think the fans got disheartened by it. It kind of ruined any positivity going into the new season, probably for the players as well. 
um, it, it's it's going to be hard for the players because you need to have that that refresh now and again. I think at, at, for the squad, just to, just to kind of add that little bit more com- competition for places, maybe, or just to go, oh hey, look, yeah, no, we're we're on board now. We've got this new player, and they're going to really make a difference, and we're going to push on in the league. There was none of that, so like everyone else is probably all knackered from summer. Um, some competitions for for the national sides and you know joe linton came back unfit because he'd been off on his honeymoon and you know there, there was loads of little mitigating circumstances going into the start of this season where we just didn't hit the ground running and 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 that's fine and and it doesn't you're not you're not losing the season in the first 10 games you're not winning the league in the first 10 games but it would be nice to kind of start on that little roll now and and i'm happy to take a loss against arsenal by the way if the performance is still there Mm-hmm. Um, for, yeah. for me, it's about just building on the momentum from this game uh, and seeing seeing what we can sort of like start the ball rolling, sort of thing. I think at home we're a match for anybody. You know, we beat um, we've we've drew with Man City. We could have won that quite easily. We we should have beat Brighton, but yeah, I don't think Arsenal will be relishing coming up, and they've got a few injuries and they le- lost their last away game. But let's let's get back to this game a bit. I think um, I do think the fact. Chelsea. I don't think Chelsea were fully um, invested in this game. They did. They only no. made one sub. They had Cole Palmer on the bench, and they didn't bother bringing him on. So, I think it's 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 fair to say that this meant a lot more to us than it did to them. So, and they didn't really look like getting back into it at all. But I think Newcastle and Eddie Howe have got a bit of a conundrum here, and it, the conundrum is Sean Longstaff in the midfield. The team gets better results factually when Sean Longstaff plays. Even if he's not playing well, I think he did play well in this game, but even if on the the face of it, um, it doesn't seem like he's playing well, if he's if he's doing some loose passes, the team p- plays better as a whole. He, he he brings balance into the midfield. He's a, and he does exactly what Eddie Howe wants him to do. And Eddie was asked about this. He said that he's intelligent, you know, he's fit. He knows he can follow instructions. How how uh, how do you square this circle of the fact that he's he's not the most talented midfielder, but the team's better when he plays. the the team The team was better today without Bruno. Obviously, yep. Bruno's not gonna not gonna not play. Tanali was really really good in that in that deep position, and then you've got Joe Willock and Joe Linton and Isak. They those three work really well together on that left hand side as well. And we've really missed Willock and Joe Linton not not being in that partnership over the last yeah. eighteen months when Joe Willock's been injured. It's a bit of a it's not it's not a bad problem to have, but the midfield three of Tanali, Bruno, and Joe Linton has not really worked properly. No. I think I don't think the balance isn't quite there. What what's he going to do about this? How is he going to how is he going to make this work in a, in a consistent way? It's yeah, it's it's a it's a tough decision for him. It's as you said, it's a nice problem to have when you've kind of you've got too many players to fit into a side because you've just won a game and you need to be able to bring players back in who are arguably world class. And you know, Bruno on his day is undroppable. I He's brilliant when he came on as well. Yeah. And he was good when he came on. My my feeling is Longstaff is one of those players that most successful teams have that is like this unsung hero that nobody seems to really like, nobody appreciates their game because they don't do anything shiny and flashy. They don't really do anything of note. They may make a couple of mistakes now and again, but what they do is free up the key players to actually be able to be free and play their own style of football that then has a bigger impact on the game. Um, and so, yeah, for, if you remember when when we qualified for the Champions League, we finished fourth in the league and we were struggling right at the end of that season because Longstaff went out injured and yeah. everyone he was missed saying, the like, game. oh, yeah, yeah. We, we missed, we miss him. Oh, we miss, we miss Longstaff. It's like, you know, and then he comes back in and because the rest of the team is all injured and we don't have those stars around him. No, he he doesn't have the game himself to carry the team. So putting a long putting long staff into a side that doesn't have those stars around him, he is found out because he does. We do need a better player, but unfortunately, it's hard to overlook him as a key piece when everyone else is fit. 
because he makes those other players around him better. Um, but the one key thing for me that I, I was gonna I was gonna throw back at you. Do you see an issue with Bruno and Tonali playing in the same side? Because I think they've struggled so far this season to have as much of an impact in games as you would think. And I wonder if it's because they were, and I, and I know I've made my my thoughts clear on the conspiracy thing that I actually think Tonali was potentially a long-term replacement for Bruno because the club were expecting him to be sold. Um, and that was the PSR angle that they were looking to to cash in on. Um, and I think they preempted a Bruno sale by buying Tonali to replace him. And then when Bruno didn't go, it's like, uh, okay, now what? Um, and they kind of had this 10-month grace period to find a solution because of, of Tonali's ban. Um, but now it's it's back up in Eddie Howe's uh, problem-solving charts. And how do you get the best mm -hmm. out of both of those players? Because on their game and on their day, they are absolutely world-class players. Tonali's on fire whenever he turns up for Italy. Uh, Bruno's playing for Brazil. He's playing really well um, sort of everywhere else. But they don't seem to be gelling properly at the moment. So what, what's your thoughts on that? Or am, I be, am I being paranoid or is just... No, I think we've, it's never really looked fully balanced and fully mm. coherent with them two in the in the midfield. Um, Tonali, when he plays for Italy, has been on the left-hand side of a three. I think they've actually played three at the back as well. So he's been in that like left central midfield role. When he's played with Bruno, he's been in the right central midfield role and he, he's been getting his fitness up as well. So, and he... But he's had, like you say, he's had, what, 12 months plus of training with them now. So he was bought, I think he was bought for that season, last season to play with Bruno. They, were, they obviously weren't going to sell him last season. But I, I agree with you that I think there was a plan or there was at least at least a thought that Bruno might go to help PSR this summer, just gone. Yeah. And then it would be easier to fit, because I think Tonali played in that deeper line role today and he did really well in the, yep. the number six defensive midfield position. But you're not going to not play them both because they're both no. so good. So exactly. Eddie's going to keep trying to work out a way of getting them together. And and performances have been getting better. You know, if we'd have beaten Brighton, that's fine. You know, and Everton, then people wouldn't be maybe having this conversation. Um, But you could look at the putting them in a two as well. You know, they could both play in like a in like a four, two, three, one kind of system. And I know tactics and formations are flexible now and we like the four three three because it fits it fits the squad we've got and the players we've got. Like you wouldn't put Sean Longstaff in a two in midfield. It just wouldn't no. work. But but he's he's perfect for that position, that right side position in a in a midfield three, because for all the reasons you just explained before. And then you throw Joe Willikin as well, who on his day is is our most dangerous midfielder in terms of goal scoring. And him and Joe Linton love playing with each other on that left-hand side because they can interchange, they can yeah. come in and out. And Isak loves playing with Willick as well. Like they, they dovetail really well a couple of seasons ago. So these are all good problems for Eddie to, to have and to try and solve. Um, but I think we might maybe have to get used to seeing maybe somebody on the bench who we don't really want to be on the bench. Longstaff's the easy one to drop to the bench mm. because he's not flashy. And um, I think Eddie's going to persevere and try and get the best out of the, the three he's got there. But he does like Joe Linton on the left-hand wing as well. And that that worked. And when yeah, I saw that... I, I like Joe Linton on the left wing. <laughs> so do I. It's, he, was, he was there a lot in, in the Champions League qualifying season. So I think... If if you've got that strength in midfield of Tonali and Bruno and another, then I think you can afford to have Joe Linton out there on the left because he goes everywhere anyway and he, he gets yeah. stuck in and you'll 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 fill in that left back or in in you know in the, in the defense if he needs to as well. So these are good problems for Eddie to have and to try and find a solution to. Um, and it's it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens. But Based on yesterday, I think it's it's going to be hard to say that Willick shouldn't start against Arsenal. Mm. Longstaff is the easy one to drop, like I said. So, but yeah, it's really this is what you want when you bring players in to to stake a claim. I think for the for the next game, isn't it? Um, but Tanari yeah, was excellent as well. It, it's an interesting thing to to look at, I guess from from our perspective as fans, we're looking at the summer at, at the summer, if not January, as let's get a right winger in. 
Um, what happens if you end up with Joe Linton playing out of his skin on the left because he's linking up well with Joe Willock, who's now playing in central midfield instead? Um, we're getting that pace and power from midfield from Willock, uh, linking up well with Joe Linton and Isak, as you said. Gordon's got to play somewhere because you can't leave him out, so he inevitably ends up on the right wing. If he starts playing on the right wing anywhere near as good as what he has been on the left wing for us, then... Do you, do you need the right winger straight away? Um, so can you can you afford to to, to hold out on that? Uh, it, it's it's a weird situation whereby players coming into form, which I think has been half the problem. To be honest, I, I I've, I've said all along. I think half the issue is is players are just not not hitting their straps at the moment. And you know, as you said, Brighton, we completely battered them off the pitch. And save for some wayward finishing, we would have easily won that game. Um, and so as players start to find form, it starts to present some some interesting situations in the in the squad where, you know, those those key areas that we were crying out for, because we've got all these players that are now in form, maybe it's not quite the priority it was. And we can we can keep our powder dry in January and, and go hard in the summer instead, hopefully on the back of qualifying for Europe. Mm. Yeah. And then with the midfield as well, you've got Lewis Miley, who came on, he's he's about eight foot tall now. So he's huge, isn't um, he? He's like shot up, he's, and he's he's bulked up as well. He's he put has, on a bit of, yeah. he's he's, a bit of muscle too. He's he's used his layoff well. Yeah, and he's been taking advice from um, fitness and conditioning coaches by the looks of things. But he's got an incredible amount of talent as well, and he this is this is going to sound silly, and I think part of the time we're talking about this as well, but. He's got that Rodri kind of profile. Like he's tall, he, he's skillful, he can pick a pass. Uh, he's got that kind of profile, you know. That kind of he could play in the defensive midfield. He could play. I was going to ask forward. you this. I was going to. I was going to say because it's 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 one of these things that annoys me with Newcastle, where we get these players coming through that look like they're good players, and we don't seem to really know what to do with them. Um, and, and we've done this for quite some time. And even with Elliot Anderson, I think we we, we struggle to know what his best position was, where we should play him. Yes, okay, he played as an attacking midfielder, kind of like almost in that number 10 role uh, when he was on loan. But, oh, well, he's not going to play that for us because we don't play that. Uh, is he is he a left winger? Probably not. Is he is he sort of supposed to be in central? You know, we didn't have a solution for that. And I want to I want to know what your thoughts are on Elliot Anderson and where you see his, his Lewis position Miley. being. Lewis Miley, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Like, to me, if... Given his size now um, and athletic profile and ability with the ball, do you see him as like an ideal candidate to kind of try and mould into that, you know, Declan Rice holding midfielder kind of role? Yeah, I was going to mention Declan Rice as well. If you look at sort of the top elite level players of that kind of stature and that kind of profile now, they can play in defensive midfield or they can play on the sort of in the number eight position, as you say. Um, Lewis Miley, he didn't really put his foot in and tackle a lot when he was no. in the team last season. Uh, and fair enough, it was a very difficult situation he was brought into. And he, he, he was only 17. Massive games. Everyone knows he was only 17. We can't say that anymore. But who knows what his best position is going to no. be. He is he is supremely talented, though. Like I think to be... Performing at the level he was when he was when he was seventeen yeah. against the teams he was playing against, he was playing against like Champions League, good yeah. Champions League opposition or top end Premier League opposition every week, and he was doing well. And then he yeah. he got his goal and he, he got injured, but he's got to come into the thinking as well. So mm. it's a it's a test of Eddie Howe's coaching and his his, uh, his tactical brain about how he's going to fit, what he's going to do with the midfield, and and how he's going to fit everybody in. Hopefully, everyone stays fit as well um but yeah it's going to be very interesting to see to see how that goes and it is good to have the options in there as well now um yeah for sure so we beat we won this game quite comfortably i think we saw it out um chelsea had a couple of chances asula hit the post with his little cameo and he, yeah. he got about 15 minutes in this one so yeah. he'll have been pleased with that he looks like little a, snippets little snippets of him look look like there's a there's definitely some talent there he looks like an absolute he's big he's strong he, he looks sharp quick, like, I quick think feet he, quick feet he, he looks like a really he's got all of the yeah. raw ingredients to be a really good player and he's he's probably in that um he's in that 
mode, isn't he? Where he's, he's come, recently come into the team and, and he's learning what Eddie Howe wants him to do. And he hasn't got a lot of football under his belt anyway. So Eddie I always, saw that today. I saw that yeah. on social media, someone pointing out. It's like, this is this is exactly what happened with Lewis Hall, yeah. where everyone was crying out for him to play football. Everyone was saying, oh, why isn't he playing? Why isn't he in the, in the team now ahead of Dan Byrne or whatever? And by Lewis Hall's own admission, he wasn't ready. He wasn't, wasn't fit enough. Fit. He didn't. He didn't yeah. know the, the 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 system enough. Um, like, and now look at him. He's he's literally like an outstanding left back. Who it's hard to know who's going to replace him. Like because he, he's undroppable at the moment for us. He's playing really well. Um, got an assist at the weekend as well. Um, so you know, let's just give Eddie Howe his time to to mold Osula properly. Give him time to develop. Don't put the pressure on him when he's not ready um, and risk ruining all of his confidence before he even gets any. Um, yeah, I, I just think like the, the, the way Eddie Howe manages his players, uh, you would just think that people would learn now not to question it because every single time people start complaining about it, it's just proof that he knows best and he knows what he's doing and he knows how to bring these players through. Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? He almost it's, he does know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing, yeah. and he, it is, he's proven that over over some time. Uh, and yeah, people, I think people should give a bit a bit of trust in him because yeah, Asula looks definitely like he's got the ingredients. Uh, he looks like a, a proper striker. So we'll we'll see what happens with him as well. But it's it was nice for him to get a bit of a bit of extra time. Uh, he's, he usually only gets about three minutes, so this time he got yeah. 15, and he, he looked good, and he, he hit the post with a good shot. Yeah. The one other person I want to talk about from this game is Lloyd Kelly. Yeah. He came. He, he he made one mistake early on where he, he gave a header away and they, they had a chance, but he made a couple of really good blocks late on, and he's got pace, and that's something that yeah. none of our other available centre-halves currently do have. I think he played really well. He can pick a pass as well, and he's versatile. He can go out to the left-hand side. Do you think he's given Eddie something else to think about in terms of does he start ahead of Dan Byrne against Arsenal in the league game? Um, he's definitely given him something to think about. Uh, I, I think when we when we um, had a chat with the, the Bournemouth fans about Lord Kelly when we were going to sign him, they said it's like give him time, give him give him a chance to play. Um, and he'll probably end up working his way into the England squad. He is that good a player, um, potentially. Uh, and, you know, he's got, as you said, he's got that pace, which we're desperate for at the back, because as good as Lewis Hall is, as good as Tino Livramento is, and Shah, you know, on his game, none of them are exactly pacey players. Um, so just having that little bit of, little bit of kind of like oh shit moment kind of pace to get back in in make those blocks and and give to give offen um offensive players like a little bit more to think about to, to me that's that's crucial and and as harsh as it's going to be on Dan Byrne because I don't think he's done a lot wrong this season um he's another one like Longstaff that just seems to get a lot of a lot of complaints about his football that I don't feel are warranted half the time um and it will be a shame for him to get dropped, but I just think the pace of Kelly and, you know, we're paying good money for him. And, and, and I know it's not what I was led to believe it was, but, you know, he's still on decent money for, for a player. So we've got him on a free transfer. So he's not going to be on, on, on a cheap wage. Yeah, I just think it's, it's going to be hard not to play him just purely and simply to get that extra pace at the back. Hmm. Yeah, D Dan Byrne is um is not quick, obviously. And if you're gonna have your centre halves drop in, like tr tagging the striker right into the midfield, they're gonna have to have pace to be able to get back if they yeah. don't win the ball. <laughs> and that's exactly what Dan Byrne didn't do against Chelsea in the in the league game. Um, so I think it's a really interesting one to watch. And we know that Eddie loves Dan Byrne, and Dan Byrne's defended well this season as well. Like the the team as a whole, we've only conceded 11 goals in 12 games, so it's less than a goal a game, and three of them are against Fulham as well. So, you know, we have defended pretty well. We, we've only scored 13 goals, so we haven't scored, you know, and that's all competitions, so we haven't been scoring a lot of goals, but um, the defence has not been bad. Um, but definitely there's a, there's a lack of pace, and it's good to have Lloyd Kelly there as an option as well. So I think that definitely the takeaway from this is that we do have a bit of depth there, which is really really important and we've got two games coming up before the next international break 
Um, and hopefully we can win at least one of these games, Arsenal or Forest, and then go into the next break with a bit of a buzz. The, we got a buzz from the quarterfinal draw because we got Brentford at home. We could have we could have had a much worse draw than that. I thought it was yep. probably the best we could get, apart from maybe Southampton or Palace at home. Um, the semi-final is probably going to include Liverpool, Arsenal, and either Spurs or Man United. Looking at the other draw, so if we're going to win this, we're going to be doing it. We're going to be doing it the hard way. We're going to yeah, we'll yes beat, again. <laughs> we'll beat Forest. We've beaten Chelsea. We're going to have to beat probably two more. Um, top four teams <laughs> if we're going to do it but who's to say we can't you know who's to say we can't get that yeah. momentum and I think it it will mean so much to us and maybe a bit more than other clubs apart from uh, it'd be nice for obviously for Liverpool's manager to win for a trophy in his first season but yeah you know it would mean so much to us and that's a nice draw isn't it compared to what we all we all fear every time we're going to get yeah. Man City, even though they've been knocked. Man City or Liverpool it's away is like, maybe Real Madrid, like someone like standard. <laughs> yeah, especially after last like last season with the Champions League draw, it's just like you couldn't have wanted a harder <laughs> a harder group stage than that. And then you see good. Aston Villa and they're struggling in the league and they're not playing anywhere near the the like the standard of clubs that we were um last season in the champions league so um yeah, yeah. fair play to villa but you know we we, we had it tough last season <laughs> we did but also i've been thinking about the champions league draw and you know this season and it, it does make me feel happy that we had that psg game and you know mm. uh, everything that happened with the return game which you know we, we, we were screwed but that home game, I think that format was really special because you got the home and away. And this yeah. this time, the team yeah, playing, they've ruined like it. Villa, yeah. Villa beat Bayern Munich, but then it's like they don't get to play them again, you know. Yeah. So it's just maybe when the knockouts start, it will be a bit better. But it just doesn't yeah. have the the games feel a bit more like like friendlies, you know, like glorified yeah. friendlies than they do with something meaningful. At this yeah, time. tick tick in a box to make sure that the that the the, the yeah. regular um, clubs get through where they should be according to all of the. The yeah, and everyone media. gets more money, of course, as well. Everyone gets more money, which yeah, is what it's all, all about. That's what football's just, about these days. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Newcastle have got the small matter of Arsenal coming yeah. up. It's Saturday lunchtime game, so it's a nice 10:30 p.m. kickoff for us. There's a there's meet, meetups going on around Australia, and um, I'm not going to be able to go because I'm going to see Cold Chisel on Sunday instead. So, I'm excited. Barnsley. About Barnsley, yeah, but um. This this game has thrown up some some drama. It's fair to say over the last three seasons, we've beaten them twice in the league in the last three seasons at St James's. They've beaten us once. They don't like it when we beat them. They don't like it at all. Um, they're still crying about the the incident of last last season with our our winning goal. How do you see this one going? It's uh, the early kickoffs are sometimes a bit hard to get the atmosphere going. Um, and Arsenal are a good, good team, even though they've got their injuries. Yeah, How do you see look, this one going? Do you, and, and do you think do you think any of the players who actually made a claim from this game are actually going to start against Arsenal? Um, it's it's going to be hard to leave a Joe Willock out, given how instrumental he seems in terms of how we play. Uh, he just injects so much pace and power into that midfield and and running from deep into like an uh, an attacking place. Um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see if any players like hold their spots. Um, as I said, I, I'd, I'd be I'd be pushing for Kelly to start just because I think you know you're getting pace out of him. You may as well try and maximize that. Um, it's it's difficult to see us beating Arsenal. Um, I think they are slowly starting to get that um, that drive and determination to to not be the runners up and not be the uh, the the bridesmaids every year. Um, it, it's difficult. Their their manager's just an absolute gobshite, and like he's just an unlikable manager. It's just he's so arrogant and arsy and like entitled all the time so as newcastle fans it's like it's hilarious when we upset them i just the big thing for me is the 12 30 kickoff with we are just we just don't have a very good track record in lunchtime kickoffs which is difficult for us because it's the the best time for us to actually have the meetups um around the country for for getting the fans together um i'm hopeful of a draw mm. yeah i think a, a draw would be a good result but at the same time, that will make it seven league games, I think it will be, without a win. And that's the kind of run that we need to 
sort that yeah. out quickly because we do have Forest coming up as well. So, um, and they're obviously in good form. So, yeah, interesting to see how this one goes. Um, I'll, I'll say, I'll best. say this. I'll say this. If we do manage to pull a win off um, on the back of this Chelsea result. I think it silences a lot of critics and it will be a huge result in terms of getting that momentum going. Um, you know, it, it's a lot different to like pulling a result out against an Arsenal side with with the crowd that then gets fully behind them than pulling out a, a, a result against Ipswich or something. And yeah. everyone's like, well, yeah, no, you should be winning that. Um, having like maybe that unexpected win um, would be just amazing. So hope, hopefully we, we get that win um, and we can build on that. But I'm, I'll, I'm going for a two-all draw. Two-all, that'd be good. That'd be exciting. I think um, we've definitely got a bit of confidence back though. And I would really just, I would feel so confident, more confident if us they lined up and there was Joe Linton and Willock on that left-hand side and then Gordon on the right. I, I feel... For some reason, I'd feel much better about that than if it was Barnes with Gordon on the right. Mm. I think Joe Linton just brings something, and that's been proven to work. And you get Willock into the team, so and yeah. well, that's against Willock's old club as well. So, all right, we'll see what happens. We will be back, I'm sure, to review that game. Um, and for people who are in Australia, you can look at Aussie Mags, and they'll have the the flashing up who's going where. Um, Brisbane will be at the Pig and Whistle on Eagle Street, like usual. Thanks for your time, Mark, and I will speak to you soon. Excellent. Take it easy, mate. Cheers.